Hello, everyone. I'm Claire. I'm the Communications Manager at VSL International. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar about bearing replacement. Ido Vank, Javier Morales, and Abraham Hidalgo will be presenting today. They all have a long experience in repair and strengthening projects, especially in the replacement of bearings. Ido is the Technical Manager of the Repair and Preservation Global Business at VSL. Javier is a Technical Manager at VSL and he specialized in the design of structural bearings. Abraham is a project manager for repair and strengthening projects at VSL, and to date, he has replaced more than 2,000 bearings. The presentation will last about 40 minutes, and then we will have a time dedicated to questions and answers. During the presentation, please feel free to write and post your questions in the question tab that you can see at the bottom right of your screen. We will answer them at the end of the presentation. I will now hand over to Ido, and I wish you all a great time. Thank you very much, Claire, and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar on bearing replacement. It's a real great pleasure and honor to have so many people uh, attending uh, from around the world. So bearings typically have a shorter design life uh, compared to the structure of a bridge, and therefore during the service life of a bridge, the bearings must be replaced a few times. Um, there are actually a large number of considerations and attention points during this operation that we will try to explain uh, to you in this webinar. But before we start with the actual content, we would like to do a quick poll to get to know the audience a bit. So um, in the, you have a some tabs on the right hand side on the bottom of your screen and one says polls and in there there's a question have you ever been involved in bearing replacement uh, so if you can please submit your votes um, and the votes are now coming in um, so we have about more than half that has not been involved in bearing replacement but the votes are still coming in so i'll wait a few more seconds for it to allow you to vote um, all right, quite good. So um, conclusion is that about 45% has been involved and 55% has never um, been involved in bearing replacement. So thank you for voting. And um, let's start. Let me start with the um, uh, agenda. So this is the agenda of today. We'll have 45 minutes of presentation and then 15 minutes to answer any questions that you might have. So don't hesitate to put your questions in the, in the question tab. Um, we will start with the explanation what bearing replacement actually is and we go through the general process. Uh, this will be presented by myself. Then we will have a section on the design and fabrication of bearings, which will be given by Javier. And we will show the actual bearing replacement of a project to show the challenges that you have of a real project. And this will be presented by Abra. Um, so what is bearing replacement? Maybe I'll start with a quick explanation what bearings are. So bearings are mechanical devices that support the deck structure uh, of a bridge and transfer the loads to the substructure, the columns and the foundation. So on the right hand side, you see a photo of a deck and you see the columns underneath and in between you have the bearings. Um, the bearings transfer the loads and allow for movements, displacements and rotations. Typically these devices are made of steel, uh, but they can also be rubber and have a lower design life uh, compared to the bridge and does need to be replaced a few times during the service life of a bridge. The operation of the replacement of the old bearings with the new bearings is what we are talking about in this webinar. Now there are several attention points that you need to consider during this operation. Uh, first of all, uh, the hindrance of the traffic. Can the operation be carried out with traffic and cause no or limited hindrance to the traffic? Uh, then during the operation, it's very important to ensure the bridge stability at all times. We are releasing the, the permanent bearings and there is thus a change in the fixity uh, that needs to be carefully managed. Uh, to transfer the loads of the bearings, we make use of jacks uh, and these jacks need to be placed somewhere. 
for this, you need space and the location of these new concentrated loads need to be checked. Uh, the structure needs to be able to resist against these uh, loads against at, at a new location. There's often a very little space below the deck and in between the columns. Um, thus, sometimes we will need specialized temporary works. Uh, the bearings that need to be replaced are often quite heavy and methods and temporary works might need to be developed to make this actual uh, displacement possible. And finally, the bearings need to sit and connect to both the column and the deck. And for that, you need some concrete works or grouting works uh, in order to install the bearings properly. The orientation of the bearing is, is important. Uh, for the structural behavior of the bridge after they are activated. So all in all, uh, quite a few attention points to consider. And what makes this operation special is bringing all these attention points together into one safe sequence. Um, so having stated all these different attention points to consider, let me summarize the overall uh, sequence and I simplify it in only five steps. Uh, so we start with the design works and the methods, the preparation of the methods, and these need to go hand in hand, they, they go together. Uh, we then install the temporary works and the access such that we can jack the bridge. And after jacking the bridge, you can replace the bearings and finish with grouting the plinths and loading back the bearings. All right, so let me go through a few of these uh, attention points in a little bit more detail. And let's start with some of the problems that we can encounter when inspecting existing bearings and the reason why we need to replace them. Um, on these photos, you see uh, worst cases. So this is not always what you see. Um, but bearings have a lower lifespan. And this means that they need to be replaced as a regular maintenance schedule. Um, so um, even if you know the, 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 the life or the age of the bearing, you might want to uh, decide to replace them. On these photos, you see some more uh, uh, serious problems that you can encounter, um, but it's obviously better to replace the bearings before you have any of these uh, such problems. On the top left, you see a rubber bearing with excessive deformation. And on the bottom left, you see a corroded steel bearing um, um, and that also can be combined with serious concrete damage and thus having to do more work in concrete repair. On the right hand side, you see two deformed uh, bearings. Uh, actually, on the right top, you see a broken bearing due to honeycombs in the, in the concrete. Um, or the, the bearing can be deformed due to bad grouting. I was talking about the splint. If that plinth is not done properly, uh, the bearing can, uh, can deform, as you can see in the bottom right uh, photo. So we use jacks to transfer the loads, to lift the bridge and to make space for the, for the operation. Uh, jacks are high pressure devices with local concentrated loads. Uh, on the bottom, you see a few different types of bearing, uh, of jacks uh, going from very low to, to, to more regular uh, uh, regular jacks. On the piers, there's often uh, limited space. Does the placement of the jacks need to be carefully chosen? And also the type of jack with the required stroke um, is to be selected depending on the, on the structure. So based on loads, uh, space, you can choose the type and the number of jacks and determine where to place them. Uh, both the piers and the decks, and the deck, the, the, the bridge deck, will need to be checked against these local loads. Uh, as it happens regularly, that existing structures have not been designed for these jacking loads. Um, but the structure is not only to be checked against the uh, uh, jack locations. There can also be a need to check the structure on uh, where and how, you, how much you jack the bridge, depending on the flexibility, the rigidity of the bridge. And then finally, you will need access for people to work. And sometimes you need temporary works um, to confine the edge. So on the, on the top right, you see a photo 
where uh, you, we could only place the jacks very near to the edge and we confined the, 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 the structure so that these jacks can be placed close to the edge. And then finally, there might also be a need for uh, new jacking supports with temporary works, uh, which I show on this slide. Uh, so um, special of, uh, uh, temporary works. Um, often there's no space on the columns and you need this temporary works to place the jack. So on the photos, you can see a couple of examples. Um, it can be a steel bracket that's fixed to the column, like you see on the left bottom. Um, but these are cored into the concrete. So you have to core into the existing columns. Or you can have special hanging bracket, brackets to prevent any coring into the existing structure, like you can see on the left top hand uh, example. Um, so the left uh, top is from Singapore and the bottom one is from Portugal. Then sometimes you need even more special arrangements to allow the jacks to be placed away, uh, away from the columns. Or worst case, you need separate towers uh, to transfer the loads of the jacks, as you can see on the bottom right uh, photo. Obviously, all these temporary works need to be designed, fabricated, and uh, erected. Next, let's talk about jacking uh, systems. Um, uh, the jacking system can be as simple as a single jack and a pump. Uh, but we can also have jacking systems as complex as computerized hydraulic systems that can cater for a large number of connected jacks where stroke and force can be individually uh, controlled. Uh, so we call these synchronized jacking systems. These synchronized jacking systems allow uh, synchronized jacking at equal displacement, even when the loads are different. And this is achieved by actively controlling uh, the opening and closing of uh, valves in small increments during the lifting and, and the lowering. There are different uh, systems available that have different properties, but it all comes down to that the operation is centrically managed. Um, you use such system when you have to jack several points at the same time when control, while controlling the loads and the displacements. So the hydraulic system complexity com uh, depends on the structure rigidity and the capacity of the structure and how sensitive the structure is for variations in force and or uh, displacements. An hydraulic system may vary from a very simple setup of pump jack and a measuring tape to a fully synchronized system with multiple pumps, uh, jacks and high accuracy uh, distance meters. So after we have everything designed and prepared and we have jacked the bridge, the actual bearing replacement can start. You have to remove and install a new bearing and these can easily weigh up to a uh, thousand kilograms. So a bearing can be too heavy to manhandle uh, and the excess below the deck uh, and in a limited space uh, does not make this a very simple operation. So that also means that that operation needs to be carefully planned in regards of methods. How is the lifting operation done? And is there a special lifting beam uh, needed uh, to get the bearing in place? Um, and often you also need a special frame uh, to deposit uh, the bearing and then slide them into place. Like you can see on, on the bottom photo and on the left uh, photos. But all these frames uh, and the space that you need to slide in the bearing uh, should obviously not clash where you have placed your jacks. So we have the bearing in place and we've put it into the correct orientation with a possible preset. And then you can grout the plinth at the top and bottom of the bearing. Uh, grouting a plinth needs special care such that there are no voids or air capture uh, in the plinth. Otherwise you get this, uh, have a risk of deforming the bearing. But also sometimes there's dowels that connect the bearing to the column and the deck. Uh, and then you require more, uh, and, and if this is on a different location, uh, then you uh, require more significant demolition. 
uh, which is obviously not very easy work in the limited space. And the photos show some of this uh, complexity. Uh, and also you need more significant concrete works um, uh, with the necessary need for formwork. So this also can add significantly to the complexity of the operation. And most importantly, adds time to the duration that the structure is not supported on its bearings. And to finish, I'd like to highlight that in order to be able to carry out all these different operations, you need to give access such that uh, we can carry out the actual works. So safe access needs to be designed such that it's not clash with any of the works and it does not hinder the traffic either above or below the bridge. So again, this needs to be designed and even its uh, installation can be a challenge uh, and a project in itself. All right, so to, to summarize the process of the bearing replacement, we've made an animation trying to summarize and simplify the process. Uh, and I'd like to show it to you now. So I hope you like that little video. Obviously, it's a, it's a simplification and some of the things could not be shown uh, uh, very detailed, like the grouting of the plinth. But nevertheless, I hope you, you liked it as a summary of the process. So to summarize, I hope that this uh, very quick introduction, uh, in this quick introduction, I've managed to show you that the bearing replacement is actually a unique combination of skills where there's a number of attention points that need to be taken into consideration. It's a special activity with high concentrated loads where construction, systems and design of both temporary works and permanent works all come together. Um, and I believe, I strongly believe that it is important that this operation is thus carried out by a company that combine all these different expertise. So before I hand over to the next speaker, let's look at uh, two uh, recent projects that we carried out. Uh, one here in Africa, in Senegal. Um, and you can already see from the photo, there was very limited space between the girders and the, and the, and the piers. So we had to use these special flat jacks. Uh, and the other challenge that we had in this project that we, uh, it was in the middle of the COVID pandemic and we still managed to mobilize and successfully complete it in uh, two months. Another project from a completely different scale in Mexico uh, was the inspection and replacement of more than a thousand bearings for a major railway line. And then obviously you can imagine that the methods need to be optimized such that you have a certain sequence to go from peer to peer. All right, with that, I'd like to hand over to Javier, who will tell us about the design and fabrication uh, of bearings. So Javier, the floor is yours. Thank you, Edo, many thanks. Um, I had to say nice pictures, um, very nice video you have shown. Eh? 
Uh, I'm Javier Morales. I'm working in building design, uh, and I will continue for a few slides, uh, as Edo said, uh, talking about the design and the supply of buildings. Uh, I will start with a simple question. Are the buildings a standardized product, or maybe are they a, a customized product? Because I will say that it's a common idea to think that the structural buildings are a completely standardized product and that the manufacturers have the warehouse full of different models that we supply as the orders of the customers arrive. But the reality is quite different since each single building is designed specifically for the requirements of each project and its location. Based on different variables such as the vertical load, the horizontal load, the required displacement, required rotation, each building is designed and tailor-made. Also, the materials of the structure, the superstructure and the superstructure, has a strong influence in the design, in the final geometry of the building, as well as the design code. Okay, it's because uh, buildings for the same loading, for the same purpose, but designing with different code can be very, very different in, in, in size. So, the overall dimensions are governed by loads, movements, rotations, design code, and the materials. But in the case of repairs or replace of buildings, the characteristics of the existing building to be replaced will determine the design of the unit. The dimensions of the old, old unit, the space available, the location of existing dowels, all those factors will determine the new design and the geometry of the unit will have to be adapted as much as possible to gently replace the old unit. Okay, the, 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 the space available is always, is always a, a, a problem in the, in the police building. So having said that, we will quickly recommend the three most popular types of building, which are the elastomeric, pod buildings, and spherical buildings. So what we are showing here is somehow a building a suitability matrix. Let's see quickly how, how uh, elastomeric, but uh, an spherical suite depending on, on the different requirements. So by looking at the matrix, we can see that the elastomeric buildings are appropriate for uh, low vertical loads, while pod buildings are a right choice for medium or medium high vertical loads. And the spherical seems to be appropriate for, for high loading. By looking at the horizontal loads, pod buildings and spherical Buildings are suitable. It's not the case of the elastomeric buildings. In case of displacements, three, both, uh, uh, the three types can take uh, displacements. Also, in a moderate case, in the, uh, for the elastomeric buildings, the rotations uh, that, can, that can be assumed are low in the case of elastomeric buildings, medium in the case of pod buildings, and can be high in the uh, in the case of spherical. The overall dimensions of the buildings. Uh, used to be a small for the systematic beatings, medium for pop beatings, and high uh, for the spherical beatings, because this is related to the to the vertical load uh, applied. On the pressure on the concrete uh, is low in the case of the, of the elastomeric, it's medium or high in the case of pot, and it's oh, it can be high in the case of the spherical. And if we look at the cost. We can simplify it saying that last meter beatings has a low cost, the medium in the case of pot beatings, and high in the case of the spherical beatings. So, as a short summary, for low demands, the last meter beatings uh, seems to be the right choice. For medium demands, we can go for a pot beating, and for high demands, the spherical uh, beating seems to be the right choice. Uh, uh, let's say that this is just a simplification, okay, because uh, there are many other factors the project and, uh, and the geometry and everything that can influence the choice of the appropriate uh, appropriate type of bidding. And let's go now for the first case, which is uh, the elastomeric bidding, which is a reinforced elastomeric bidding, which is something as simple as a piece of rubber with steel plates inside. Okay, the rubber is vulcanized together with the steel inside the mold by applying pressure and heat. And then the adhesion between both materials is, is huge. It's so huge that the rubber does not extrude when we apply the vertical load on the building. 
obviously it has a limit, but but uh, the, the, the rubber with a with a normal uh, vertical load, the rubber will not destroy it. Let's say that the elastomeric beams are a cost-efficient solution for low or moderate loads, movements, and rotations. And when we design the, these units, the vertical loading is the one which determines the plane dimensions of the beating, but not the height, because the height is determined by the required rotations and displacements to be assumed. The, rota uh, the rotations and displacements are taken by deformation, so bigger rotations and displacements imply a greater height. And we can say that they are okay up to 10,000 kilonewtons. We, we can design and fabricate uh, buildings for uh, beyond the limit, obviously. But uh, then probably I'm pretty sure that this, this is not the most uh, the more cost effective solution. And then it's better to go for another type of bidding. Pot beatings. A pot beating is also a elastomeric, um, elastomeric beating, but quite different because in this case, the elastomer is elastomeric disc which is confined inside the pot. Okay, there is no steel inside the rubber. It's a, it's a disc confined in a pot. Consequently, since it's confined, the pressure in the rubber can achieve around two or three times the pressure on the elastomeric beating, and obviously the smaller uh, the dimensions will be smaller than the equivalent. Uh, Elastomeric uh, reinforced the elastomeric beating. Uh, let's say that the under under high pressure, the rubber which is confined behaves like a liquid, and consequently, we require also a sealing system to avoid the extrusion of the rubber. Okay, it's a little bit it's more complex than than elastomeric beating. But similar to the elastomeric beating, the vertical load is the one with that will determine the diameter of the pot, with the plane uh, geometry. The rotations will also determine the height of the elastomeric disc, because the height is the one which allows the, the rotation of the unit. But if we need uh, to allow displacement, mm, we need something else, OK? Because the, the, uh, the elastomer is confined, it cannot move, cannot allow movements, horizontal movements. So we have just seen that the rubber can take the vertical in the pot beating, the rubber can take the vertical load and the low rotations, but the elastomer cannot accommodate displacement because, because it's confined. So for that reason, in the design and the manufacturing of the pot beating is necessary to use sliding materials and guides to create fixed, guided, or free sliding pot beatings. If we look at the fixed unit, which is in the in the left. The upper plate and the piston form a single piece, which is made from a solid block of steel. Okay, it's a steel plate mechanized with the with the shape of the upper plate and the piston, and it, it cannot uh, any, any movement can be produced in, in this case any horizontal movement. If we look at a free sliding unit, the upper plate and the piston are different elements, and between them there is a flat sliding surface, which is policy style is steel on PTFE, it's uh, Teflon. And this flat sliding surface is the one which allows the longitudinal and transverse movements. And if we look at the guided, it's something similar to the free sliding, but adding a guide, uh, so it's a mix between the first model and the second model. We have the free sliding materials, we have a guide blocking a movement, so what we uh, uh, achieve by doing that is the, that the free movement, we have free movement parallel to the guide, but the movement perpendicular to the guide is completely blocked. And let's go now for the last model, which is the spherical unit. The spherical beatings are something similar to a pole beating, but in this case, the rotation mechanism is based in a spherical surface, which is a keep with sliding materials so that the intermediate convex metal part can rotate freely. It is to understand that we, uh, it, they can be designed to accommodate bigger rotations than the pot beatings because we only have to do the, the, convex, the convex part larger. The dimensions of the spherical beatings are smaller 
than the equivalent pot beating, since the limiting factor in the design is the characteristic content strength of the selenium material, which is typical, typically PTFE with Teflon. And this characteristic content strength is around 40 or 50% bigger than the characteristic content strength of the rubber in the case of pot beatings. And like the pot beatings, the spherical beatings can be combined with flat sliding surfaces and guides to create fixed, guided, or free sliding beatings. And uh, an alternative in the case of the spherical beatings is to um, uh, equip them with a special sliding material, no PTFE, so a different sliding material, which in our case uh, is called BSLIDEM. This is sliding material has an improved uh, improved beating capacity because the, the, its uh, characteristic content strength is 180 MPa, which is double than the beating uh, capacity of the standard PTFE. Okay, this is double than the the, the value considering uh, in the European code, just a reference. Uh, it, it's uh, they have a bigger operational temperature range because they can work up to 90 degrees Celsius, which is quite a lot. And obviously, since they can take a uh, bigger pressure on the sliding material, their dimensions will be uh, smaller. They have compact dimensions, OK? And consequently, in many cases, since they are going to be smaller, they can be a better uh, cost-efficient solution. Uh, it's important to, to take care with the pressure in the concrete because we can make a very small unit to take a high vertical loading but we have to check the pressure on the concrete okay let's say that the use of this special sliding material it's very helpful in the case of building replacement where the space is reduced because in 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 building replacement the space is is what it is we cannot uh extend this space so uh if we uh need to reduce the dimensions of the of the new building to adapt to the existing space, this can be a, a, a very good solution. And just to finalize uh, my part, I would like to show a pair of pictures uh, of our modern uh, BSL facilities in, in Barcelona, in the factory where we um, design and manufacture the buildings. Uh, in, our facilities are certified with the ISO uh, 9001. We have the CMR for the elastomeric beatings, for pot beatings and spherical beatings. We have also a CMR and a special technical, uh, European technical approval for spherical beatings equipped with this special sliding material BS Light M. We have also the certification according to the EN 1019 for the execution class number four, which is the which is the top. And in case is uh, required for a specific project, we can achieve also special certifications, like is the case of the ACATS for the paint in the UK, or maybe we are uh, uh, the certification for Canada according to the Canadian Welding Bureau. Um, and that's it. All right, thank you very much, Javier, uh, for that uh, interesting presentation on bearings. And I quite liked the photos of the last slide, which looks like a clean room. So quite different to the situation that we have once we have to install them on site. Um, so let's move on to the next speaker. Um, we see that your questions are coming in. So that's great. Very good questions. We will have time for them to, to go through them after, um, after our presentations. But before that, I'd like to hand over to Abraham who will tell us about the actual replacement of an actual project in the Canary Islands. So Abram, please go ahead. Thank you, Ido, for this introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Abraham Hidalgo. I'm project manager of BSL Spain in the repair and strengthening department. And I will present to you the replacement of the pot bearings of the Viaducto de Silva in the Canary Island in Spain. For those who don't know, Canary Islands are located in the Atlantic Ocean in front of the south coast of Morocco, and they are 1,700 kilometers far from Madrid. Because their status as remote islands, they have a special tax systems and customs, even with the internal commerce with the mainland. 
And between 2018 and 19, BSL carried out a major refurbishment of seven bridges built in the 70s in the island of Gran Canaria. The bridge belongs to a very busy road from the, the GC2, from the north of the island to the capital, and our works must be adapted to the traffic. As you can see, the bridge are in front of the sea, and this is a volcanic island with a very steep and inaccessible slopes, and the environment is quite aggressive. Our work uh, includes a big structural repair job in some of the structures. We applied an anti-carbonatation coating to all the bridges, and also we replaced 200 elastomeric bearings in some bridges and the eight pot bearings of the Viaducto de Silva, that is the case I will explain to you. The Viaducto de Silva is a very emblematic bridge in Spain, designed by Ingeniería Torroja in the 1976, and it was the highest bridge in Spain at the construction time. With a total length of 416 meters, it has a longitudinal slope of 6% and a strong curvature in plan. With a radius of only 390 meters, the design was very conditioned to the orography of the land. The main span is 120 meters and the intermediate spans are 90 meters and laterals 58 meters. The central piers are 110 meters high and they are one of the highest in Spain. The deck is a post-tensioned box girder built by Balance Cantilever, and it is connected to the central piers supported at external piers with fixed bearings, and there are longitudinal guided and free bearings in the abutments. All these pot bearings will be replaced. At the beginning of the project, there was not much information about the bearings due to the difficult taxes, and the first ta task we made was to assess the bearing condition and the context focusing on the replacement operation. We made some inspections with an underbridge unit, and as you can see in the pictures, we confirmed that the existing bearings were in really bad shape, and in some cases, they were not working. Also, we made inspections inside the box girder and found a vertical PT in the walls and near the location of the bearings. There was no records or evidence of maintenance among these 40 years, and the main constraint for this job was that only temporary one line closures during day were permitted and the access was very difficult because we can only work from the upper road, not from the bottom of the piers. And also special temporary walls were needed because the weight and size of the new bearings. There was no asbuilt drawings of the existing bearings and the design premises of the new bearings had to consider new codes be replaceable and fit the existing location. And as you can imagine, satisfy these three conditions made a challenge for the design. The existing dowels were totally unknown and couldn't be reused. And for that reason, you don't see a huge dowels in the Mason replace in this picture. Instead, we place multiple uh, small stats distributed all over the intermediate place, trying to fit between the existing reinforcement. These studs allow us to avoid the existing PT in the lower section of the structure, as well as guarantee a barely invasive demolition because we reduce a lot the affected depth of the structure. With these new intermediate plates, we have an easy replacement bearings for the future, and it is just a matter of removing four balls. So we work close to our technical department and our factory to develop this tailor-made design, and after some iterations, we arrive to a 10 millimeters higher new bearing with around one ton of weight. And as Javier said at the, at the beginning, this in this kind of works, every millimeter is relevant and we will see the consequences later. To the proximity of the sea, a C5 coating protection was applied to all the steel components of the bearings. In this kind of works, uh, it is very useful to have a method statement with a description of, of the process step by step without underestimating any of the tasks, no matter how small they are. It is very important to check all the interference or clashings during the works, because the scaffold, the temporary walls, the demolished area, especially next to the lifting points and anchoring points, the lifting means, the traffic management, and the replacement of the pot building itself. And as Edo said, all the structures were not designed considering the replacement of the bearings, and this one, one of these cases, it was necessary a temporary strengthening of the deck with some transversal post-tensioned PT bars to compensate the eccentricity of the new jacking points. And if you, we talk about taxes, usually it's one of the most difficult part of these maneuvers. 
And if you remember, we had a very busy road in use and only temporarily single lines closures permitted. And we didn't have access from the bottom of the pier. So we use a hanged scaffold installed from top to the bottom with a counterweight placed on the road just to install the main hanging points of the scaffold and then continue with the installation until the middle of the pier and after that from the other side. And every anchor of the scaffold was tested before hanging any support. It was a requirement from the property. And we weren't allowed to let any structure on the road during the night. So the access of the scaffold was installed and dismantled every day. And after the scaffold was checked and open to work, we installed a temporary structure to install lifting jacks and the bearings. And it was completely independent from the scaffold. You will identify it with uh, red colored beams in the pictures. And it was required a third party check for the scaffold and temporary works. And regarding the lifting setup for this job is quite simple. It is a two row of three units of 670 ton pancake jacks with 45 millimeters stroke with swivel and safety net and a, and a weight of 260 kilograms. So impossible to handle by hand. And they are connected in two circuits to allow to leach each side independent because the bridge is in curve and the reactions will be quite different in both sides. It was expected 900 tons of force per row and two jacks was the strictly necessary. But in this case, we placed three jacks to reduce the local pressure on the top of the pier. There was a monitoring of displacement and pressure in place with sensors to control with accuracy the real forces and displacements during the maneuver. And it was a valuable information for the designer to cross check with the model. If we go to the replacement operation, the lifting was carried out during daylight with the bridge open to traffic and only a special heavyweight transports were prohibited. We lifted about 10 millimeters with a total lifting force of 1,800 tons and the bridge was mechanical secure adjusting the safety nuts of the jack. The bearings were replaced one after another just to guarantee the fixed condition of the bridge with only one unit. This was exhaustive analyzed by the designer. And then we removed the balls of the dowels. We, we were very lucky because they weren't rusted and it was not necessary more severe techniques to remove it. And we slide the pot bearing out with a lever block on the top of a temporary structure. Using a crane located in the twin bridge, we take it out from the sliding structure. And once the building was removed, we used the hydro demolition technique to surgically demolish the concrete to make the space for this new higher building and the new studs. Then to install the new bearing, it was needed to dismantle it in parts because the total aid with the studs was much higher than the available aid. So it was impossible to install it in one piece. And finally, with the bearings at its final position, we install a perimeter foam work and poor high strength cell leveling growth. And after getting the required strength of the mortar and replace the two bearings, we transfer the load from the lead cylinders to the bearings. And just to summarize, I want to highlight the main aspects of this project from the operation point of view. The first one is that we adapt all our procedures to keep the bridge in use all doing all the works and don't disturb the traffic. That was the main concern of our client. The two works were carried out in an island quite far from our comfort zone and it led us to select new local subcontractors and labor and also this deal with customs, uh, deal with customs inside our, our own country. And another key point is that work with all structures can involve some unknowns as this vertical PT and some change during the project. And the last one, it is very important to make an exhaustive analysis of the process step by step, including the review of all these temporary works by expertise companies. That's all from my side. I hope you found it interesting and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Abram. I definitely found it very interesting to see the actual challenges that you have on a real project. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the audience for listening. Uh, and uh, your questions have been coming in. So we now have time to answer your questions. 
um, you will get a notification to download a leaflet with the summary uh, of the activity of bearing replacement. Uh, feel free to download it. Um, and the recording of the presentation will be also made available to you after the uh, webinar. Um, during this session, while we were presenting, we had Andreas Swartz, the manager of the repair and preservation business within VSL, to monitor your questions. So I'd like to hand over to him to, to, to go through the uh, Q&A session. Thank you, Ido, and uh, thanks, uh, Javi and Abraham, for uh, found a very good presentation. It has certainly triggered a lot of interest, I think, and we have a lot of very good questions, and you kept me busy trying to collect them all and group them such that we can hopefully respond to a good chunk of them uh, in the next uh, 10 or 12 minutes. We will come back to all of you who have uh, asked questions uh, if they have re remained unanswered in this Q&A session. So don't worry if we can't uh, treat them here, we will come back to you individually. Um, maybe to start off with, uh, maybe a question that I can put to you, Ido. Um, we had quite a few questions around, can the bridge be, can the bearing replacement be done under traffic and also more specifically uh, on the railway viaducts? What would you uh, respond to that? Okay, yeah. The, um, well, let me start with uh, regular road traffic. Uh, so there are countries where you're not allowed to jack with traffic. Uh, so then what we typically do is while, while we do the jacking, uh, there is a traffic uh, closure. Uh, but in other countries, we are also allowed to do uh, jacking with traffic. Uh, you just have to make sure that the structure uh, can take it. And obviously, if you're near an expansion joint, that you don't have any uh, any uh, uh, steps. In regards of <coughs> uh, uh, rail traffic, so that's a bit more sensitive to any displacement. Uh, so typically, we do do this in uh, in uh, night closures with the rail traffic. All right. Um, so maybe uh, connected to that, uh, a question for for Abram. I mean, obviously we are doing this uh, with hydraulics. So uh, what are the safety measures uh, in case of uh, hydraulic leaks during the operation? So during the lifting, usually you use check valves in the in the cylinders to avoid a leak in the in the hose that you release all the load. But also you try to, uh, with the say with the ring nuts, you try to keep them in the in the next to the cylinder body and make small steps to completely be sure that you don't have a leak and you have a vertical displacement. But also for sure we prepare our jacks in our warehouse and we load test all of them before making these kind of operations. Okay. Um... Then why don't we talk about checking, uh, maybe to uh, give this one back to you, Ido. Uh, we had quite a number of questions on how to calculate uh, or estimate the checking loads. And does it always require a full bridge assessment before a bearing replacement operation in order to determine these checking loads? Uh, no, no, it doesn't always need a full bridge assessment. Um, you can you can try to find existing drawings and and get the bearing schedule such that you have the capacity of the of the uh, bearings such that you can get an idea of what is the self weight and the and the live load. Um, you can obviously do a, a a quick calculation based on the weight of the deck or the structure to try and determine uh, self weight. Um, and sometimes also on bearings itself, there is a, there's, there's, there's information listed on the bearing that will give an indication of the capacity of the bearings. So there's several ways that you can go into. Um, so, yeah. And, yeah, and this will, uh, of course, always depend on the level of documentation available for a structure. I mean, we know it all too well, and I'm sure a lot of the participants know it well, that sometimes you have old structures where you have very little or no documentation. And sometimes you have structures where you have full bearing schedules available, uh, which obviously is always a, a good starting point. So it depends a lot on, on the degree of documentation of the structure as well. Um, all right, then um, uh, uh, next question maybe for you, Javier. You don't get away without questions. Um, 
Uh, very good one, actually, uh, linked to uh, the sustainability aspects of what we do. Uh, is it possible to recycle parts of the bearings or to refurbish parts of the bearing? Yes, is it possible? Is it possible? We can refurbish the, the entire bearing. Uh, many times the problem is to to get the certificates of the steel parts that we uh, of the of the old unit to to rely on on the, the on the material. So at the end, in many cases, it's a problem of documentation, as, as you just explained it. And uh, I will say that also in many cases, uh, you can try to uh, reuse the old unit, but um, if, you, if you have to reuse the old unit, you have to take it out, send it to the factory, uh, do the jobs, and send it back to the job site. And it is, can take quite a long time. And compared to the to the cost of the whole operation or, or the implication of the whole operation, this this is too many times compared to the cost of a new unit. So maybe mm, it has to be studied case by case. It has to be maybe right. it's not always the same uh, the, the best the best choice. All right, and and I do remember some projects where we have been involved where we have refurbished bearings, and then sometimes the strategy was to add a certain number of new bearings. If you have the same type of bearing and then you can go into a rollover mode where you remove bearings and mm -hmm. you, you have the time to to refurbish them in the factory uh, very good so um then a bit little bit linked to this question of what can be reused uh, and and abram uh, uh, i guess you're the best to respond to that there were a lot of questions about the possibility to reuse dowels i mean you showed on the project example in this case uh, you switched from dowels to nelson studs but in general, what would be your uh, response to the question on reuse of, of existing bearing dowels? Uh, the question also is linked to this uh, documentation and, and quality certificates of the existing dowels, because usually you don't have the documentation, but in case you have all the proper documentation and you make some inspection that the dowels that are already installed are the ones that they are in the drawings you can reuse them but usually you if you want to keep one product uh, with a global uh, certificate usually we don't reuse them right, because so again, uh, case by case because sometimes when we make this hydro demolition technique as you can as you see here you make you have some surprises what it's inside the concrete it's not always the same that yeah. it's in the in the drawings Absolutely. Okay, I think we have maybe time left for two or three more questions. Um, we had a, a question or actually a number of questions. Um, what are the criteria to replace bearings? Uh, so obviously, either you showed some examples where bearings have been or visibly deteriorated or heavily deteriorated, but then in many cases, that's not the case. And you know your bearing has been in place for 20, 30 years. What are the cr criteria to replace them? And then maybe uh, attached to that for Javier, what in particular for elastomeric bearings, what are the criteria to replace? But Ido, maybe we start uh, first with the general response to that. Yeah, yeah. So it all comes down to inspection and knowing what is most important is that you know the uh, uh, the state of your structure and also the state of your bearing. So I think what is most important is to do regular inspections such that you see the 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 the, the life of the of the bearing. Um, then the time that you want to replace them also is related to quite often you have a highway bridge that has other reasons to intervene and you want to limit the, the uh, hindrance that you provide by the intervention that you're doing. So often it's combined with other works uh, at the right time or at the time that you think oh, this bearing is reaching its end of life. You combine it with concrete works or painting works or other uh, strengthening works. Um, so knowing the status, following it, and then based on, um, on combining it with other works to uh, reduce the hindrance. And maybe, Javier, you can say something about uh, elastomeric bearings. Yeah. Um, in the case of elastomeric bearings, I think that the clue is the... The condition of the external rubber, which is the one which is exposed, and is the one who is going to uh, to damage. 
uh, the inner rubber, if the external rubber is okay, the inner rubber is, is okay for it. But there are other conditions to, to keep in mind, which is the, maybe that the beam has excessive deformation or excessive rotation, or maybe it's uh, the elastomeric beam can be out of its uh, original location because it has, has uh, maybe it has a slide. And, it, and there are may, uh, many things to, to that that can that, that can uh, influence in the sliding of the building. Okay, there is no there is no, there is no clue. Maybe uh, the, this, the designs of the on the on the on the bridge uh, have been bigger than than what was uh, considered in the design, or maybe it was a poor installation, or maybe the the friction between the bidding on the on the on materials of the bridge was lower than the, that it was considered. There are many many factors. That, that so again, it needs to a, a high uh, or a good quality inspection, and then obviously engineering assessment uh, mm -hmm. uh, case by case. Very good. Uh, I would like to put one last question to you, and uh, please keep the answer short uh, because of time. But we we could and we should talk about this longer. It's a very interesting one. And this is about how to deal with the temporary fixity of the bridge. It was mentioned a couple of times during the presentations, and in particular, how to deal with cases where we have locked in horizontal stresses. Uh, for example, on railway bridges where you have multiple fixed points to distribute braking loads or in seismic conditions. So what would be a, a short general answer to that? Maybe Ido first, Abraham. Yeah, maybe Abraham can also say a few words, but maybe let me start. Uh, so yeah, this is obviously a very important point. You need to ensure the fixity, fixity of the bridge. Um, like Abraham was saying on his project, uh, they were doing it bearing by bearing. And that's maybe the preferred way that you ensure that the bearings that are not replaced take over the fixi fixity of the bridge. Um, then um, you can also have, if you sometimes you replace a free moving bearing uh, then you can put a sliding surface such that you allow for the free moving. And in other, in some cases, we also uh, will have to use some temporary works. So, uh, so a, a shear key type of, of, of fixity uh, to ensure a temporary fixity uh, when that cannot be provided by the bearing. Very good. And also it's very important to say that uh, jacks cannot take horizontal load despite in the in all the brochures you, you see 5% or something like that, you need to rely to a temporary work so, uh, or pot beating or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, we have quite a, a number of other interesting questions around instrumentation of bearings and one particular very interesting one. Can you replace the main pylon bearing on the cable state bridge? I would say short answer is yes. Get in touch with us. We can certainly help you with these special cases. <laughs> But I think we wrap up the Q&A session here and I hand back to, to Claire for the closure. Thank you, Andres. So yeah, that's a wrap for this session. Thank you all again for joining today. So as Andreas said, we ran out of time and could not answer all your questions. So for those who posted questions in the chat, we will get back to you with answers by email shortly. Also, in a few minutes, you will get the replay of the webinar by email, as well as our contact information. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And you can access the recordings of our past webinars anytime through the private space of the VSL website. And please also note that a brand new VSL bearing technical catalog will be available shortly and it will be emailed to you. Of course, VSL will be holding other webinars in the coming month, so we'll definitely stay in touch. And I wish you all a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.